So welcome to chapter 20. This is the kind of final chapter in this series of 18, 19, and 20 that looks at qualitative research and some things that are unique to it and how we do it. So in chapter 18, we talked about what is qualitative research. In chapter 19, we looked more at like data collection and how do we get that information from clients. Finally, we're gonna look at qualitative data analysis. Once you've done your interviews or your focus groups, how do qualitative researchers make sense or meaning out of what they found? Once we've collected all of our data, now we get to analyze it. And what we find is that data analysis is a little different with qualitative research, but it's still really structured. It's not going through and closing your eyes and putting your finger on a transcript section and saying, that's what I'm going to say a theme is. There is really a process for it. So how do we actually do that? How do you take, let's say, interviews from 25 people, hundreds of pages of transcripts, and cram it into a 20-page article? Well, there's a couple things that we do. We look mostly for patterns or themes. We look for consistency between individuals. That's how we start to build either a theory or how we make sense of what people are saying and how it compares to each other. When we're looking for patterns and themes, they often fall into one of several categories. Ruben and Babby quote Laughlin and Laughlin, and what they said is that we are typically looking for patterns in different areas, including frequency. So you might interview multiple people and try to see how often does something come up? How often did something happen? Happen. How often did something get mentioned? You might be looking at magnitude, so how extreme or how much variation is there between participants that you interview. We might be looking at structures, so structures of an issue. If I'm doing a study with a bunch of individuals who were abused as children, I might look at what are the different types of abuse as perceived by the clients or the participants themselves. We might look at processes, so is there an order about the issues that we see? We might look at cause, so what are some relationships between items? Items, what causes what, depending on what the clients identify, or consequences. So what are the effects of an issue? If we're looking at something that happened in childhood maybe, and now we're looking at adults as they recount this, what effects has it had on them as adults? What are the themes that you see between those transcripts or those interviews? You can also look at data through a variable-oriented analysis. This is really identifying those variables and looking at relationships between them. You can do a case-oriented analysis where you're looking at one person or one system STEM. Remember, we talked about that idea of like single subject design. You're looking at one case and you try to understand what are the elements or factors that influence that person or organization or system. Or we can do what's called the conversation analysis. So this is a deep scrutiny of how we converse or interact with each other. I found a really interesting article and I've seen a number of them. It doesn't just have to be verbal conversation. There's been a lot of research starting to look at conversational analysis to online talk, to discussion boards, to how we engage with people people behind a computer. So Paula Set Al in 2016 wrote an article called Applying Conversational Analysis Methods to Online Talk, a Literature Review. So there's absolutely a need for conversational analysis, not just in the face-to-face -face world, but things like the online world, or you have that grounded theory method, which really, again, involves that inductive process of building hypotheses and theories. And so the book goes over the four stages related to grounded theory method, where you compare incidents, you integrate categories and properties, you delimit the theory, which is simplifying it, and then you write it up to share with others. So definitely different kind of lenses, but again, still very structured and orderly when we're coming when it comes to analyzing qualitative data. One thing that we talk a lot about with qualitative research is the use of coding. And in the next chapter, we'll talk about what coding looks like for quantitative data. With qualitative, coding is a really great tool. It allows us to synthesize a lot of data, whether that's records or transcripts. And what we do is we classify or categorize individual pieces of data. So coding can be done either manually. There is a great video I found online and like they did it before a great software where you would print out all the transcripts, highlight them in different colors cut them out and then put all the different colored sections together. Or you can use software, which is what a lot of researchers do. You can use things like Word. They have really cool software like Invivo or Zotero that can help with this process as well. There is a process to coding. And you'll watch a short video in the module on this, so I'm not gonna go over it in too much detail. But the idea is there's open coding where you go in with no preconceived notions. You just go in, you start looking at themes and noting them here and there. Then we start doing axial coding where we look at how the codes affect each other and then selective coding, where we find one large central theme between the different axes that we created with the axial coding. Again, really good video in this module that gives more detail about that process. 
Finally, we talk a lot about memoing while analyzing data. So memoing plays this important role in helping increase reflexivity during the process. In the last chapter, we talked about reflexivity and that idea that we're always acutely aware of how our own biases can affect the research we're doing, how we're interpreting things, and the research we're doing can also affect us, which then can affect the research. And so one way that we can do this is memoing. And this is that idea that as you're going through and you're analyzing, you're coming up with patterns, you're also noting things that it triggers in you or observations you have or things that you want to think of. This is a great example from Kong that looked at individuals and abusive relationships. And so on the left is the transcript, but then memoed on the right, where the writer really went through and talked about what are the connections. You can see that she had several notes and things to connect different lines. And so memoing really helps us make sure we're putting our observations in a very structured way. We can use it for reflexivity and say, what is this triggering in me or what are my personal observations? It's a great way to help us structure our data analysis and qualitative research. So finally, let's look at an example of the write-up. So there's different approaches, but ultimately we're always looking for patterns or connections. And and we're going to write it up typically with some sort of demographic information. It's not uncommon to do a little bit of quantitative data analysis on that demographic, the sample, how many people were in it, what were their ages, that kind of thing. We'll talk about that more in the next chapter. But what you'll do is you'll have the demographic information. What was the sample? What was the subject? Then they'll identify a series of themes. So this is an interesting article where they interviewed individuals who were going into public child welfare. And so a lot of times what you'll see, they coded everything, they noticed some themes, Themes, and then the article includes those themes. So they talked about why did you enter public child welfare? They did a really nice little summary. And then they actually have direct quotes underneath from the participants. And that's really common as well. You don't put every quote from every participant, but a lot of qualitative research will include quotes or sections or parts of the transcript just to highlight the theme. You don't want to just say, hey, the theme was this and have nothing to back it up. So a lot of times qualitative research will pick sections or parts of transcript that really strengthen the evidence that this isn't just something one person came up with, multiple people talked about this. So that is a super quick overview of qualitative data analysis. Moving forward, we're gonna look at quantitative data analysis, which is slightly different, but also includes coding and descriptive stats. So I'm excited to see you in the next chapter.